Day tribute to the thousands of New Zealand servicemen and women who fought in World War II. Each of them has a personal story of their war, but one Kiwi in particular made his own piece of history in the D-Day landings. He is Johnny Holton, fighter ace, who on this day 50 years ago was flight commander leading blue section of 485 squadron. Holton shot down the first German aircraft in what became the biggest ever military invasion. With him on that historic flight were Kiwi fighter pilots Eddie Atkins, Red Mason and Mac MacDonald, who between them scored a double. They also felled the second German aircraft of D-Day. Johnny Holton is now in England, an honoured guest at the RAF D-Day celebrations. Bob McNeil went with him to relive Johnny's war. No candle shoots, no fiery streaks, no mid-air blasts, no ditchings deep. It's never going to happen to me. Empty chairs and unslept beds, extra space at the bar. The best of reasons for a late, late night, making sure the eye stays dry. Sadly turning his face aside from the chaos of an earth time day. Above that anguished background was he really heard to say, that for as long as man must fight and fly, there is no other way. For Spitfire ace and poet Johnny Holton and thousands of other New Zealanders, there was no other way. 500 German bombers and Messerschmitt fighters roared over the English coast. We knew damn well that if, if the Nazis weren't stopped, we'd all be either speaking German or dead. There's no question about staying home. You had, it had to be stopped. It was an evil tide rolling over the whole of Europe, and, but it eventually covered the whole world. The British met the challenge by throwing in everything they had. The casualty rate for the New Zealand Air Force was extremely high. Even after two out of three people who served in the air crew became casualties. But Johnny wasn't one of those casualties, which is in itself a miracle. That he'd be sitting on a field in England almost 50 years to the day later, watching OUV for Vicky Land, and that the plane in which he took on the Nazis on D-Day and officially entered history has survived with him, well, the chances of that are 50 million to one. G'day, Vic, you old bastard. G'day. G'day, how you doing? Oh, Long you time fine. no see. <laughs> sure, you haven't changed much? Yes, yeah, eh? Yeah, hold on a minute. Oh. Let's have a look. You got yeah, look, I still got hair to your neck. You have changed. Yes. Yeah. Hello, Ronga. How you going? How are you? Good. Nice to see you. After all this time, ain't it? Yep. To have his ground crew with him from all that time ago. Yeah. You look as young as ever, John. Oh, the fatter, fatter he'll get you everywhere. And to have them help him take delivery of the plane again just for a day was something none of them could ever have imagined. You ever expect at the age of 74, Ron at 73, Three. and I know John... I'm still the youngest. Yes, you're still the youngest. 71. We'll yeah. be together again. It's yeah. just unbelievable. Now, what's my way? The fighter boys, the Brookheen boys, as they were called. Yeah, we'll go on out. Go in. There we go. Are you coming? <laughs> the next reunion is with Jackie. 50 years ago, she delivered the Spitfire to him, brand new. Today in the air, she took the controls from Carolyn Grace, the present owner, and did it again. What a clever girl you are. How are you? How are you Pretty good. Johnny has to sign for the plane, just as he did back then. And this is a collection kit when you keep one and, and I take one back to the ferry pool. Okay. Do you want me to sign one? Yes, please. Show me this. Now look, Jackie, you brought me this magnificent machine. Now, some years ago, I was Foundation President of the New Zealand Fighter Parts Association. Now, the Association membership is open to anybody who's ever flown a, a fighter aircraft, doesn't matter when or where. Um, nothing to do with the wood, nothing to do with operations, so Jackie, I won't attempt to pin it on because I, I might do you an injury. I designed the badge, it's the same as we have on the, on the logo. Oh, I'm very thrilled. Yeah, that. <laughs> <sighs> it's the part that always used to annoy me, having to stand on the seat with your dirty boots. Oh. One of the funny things that happen, it happened regularly. It became a habit of the pilots to piddle on the tail wheel for luck before we went off on a sortie. It relieved, it relieved us greatly, but the, the, the riggers used to complain bitterly. They said, we've got to work on the damn thing. What are we waiting for?
I got frightened like everybody else. The sort of fears that every fighter pilot has about being burnt or maimed. It's natural, isn't it? You worry about that sort of thing, you, you think about it. But you suddenly your mates went the same way. You weren't thinking of the enemy, of a, of a person, you were thinking of the aeroplane. You're attacking the aircraft, not the pilot. Occasionally you catch a glimpse of each other. But it didn't, was meaningless. It really didn't mean anything. Personal satisfaction always to clobber an enemy aircraft, but I never personally got too excited about it, because tomorrow it could be my turn, who knows? They always were a dream of a thing to fly, so there's quite a lot of turbulence flying around. But it's still very, very enjoyable indeed. Probably the last time I'll ever, I'll ever fly an aeroplane of any sort. But it's quite nice to think that it's this, this particular Spitfire.